I would like you to make a fist. Now open and close it about 60 times a minute. Normally, a person's heart is the same size as their fist. By the way, it is the first organ to start functioning. It starts beating when the embryo is only 21 days old and keeps on chugging till death. My heart has already beaten over two and a half billion times. In this video, I will give you an overview of the location of the heart, then use isolated heart specimens to demonstrate the salient features, starting with the pericardium. I will go on to the external and internal features of the heart and end with the blood supply. In this specimen of the thoracic cavity, I want you to note the sternum, the ribs, and the diaphragm. This is the cut edge of the pericardium. This is where the heart was located. In this specimen, note how the heart is surrounded by the lungs and rests on the diaphragm. Because this surface of the heart is related to the sternum and the ribs, it is called the sternocostal surface. Here is a heart surrounded by pericardium. The word is derived from Greek. Peri means around and cardia means the heart. It consists of two sacs, an outer fibrous sac and an inner serous sac. The fibrous sac is fused with the roots of the great vessels and blends with the diaphragm, with the central tendon of the diaphragm. I cut the pericardium over here. As I reflect this, the pointer is now over the parietal layer of the serous pericardium. These two layers, the serous parietal layer and the fibrous pericardium are fused with each other and you cannot separate them. The visceral layer of the serous pericardium is on the heart muscle itself and that forms the epicardium. Between the parietal and the visceral layer is the pericardial cavity, which contains a little bit of fluid for lubrication. I'm now inserting the pointer into the pericardial cavity. Can you recall a nerve running along this line between the pericardium and the pleura? What is its distribution? Why is the pericardial pain referred to the shoulder? What supplies the visceral pericardium? For orientation, note the superior vena cava, right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, aorta, and the pulmonary trunk. Atria and ventricles are separated from each other by a groove or constriction called the atrioventricular groove. It completely encircles the heart. And as the coronary artery is located in this groove, this is also called the coronary sulcus. Underneath these vessels is the anterior interventricular sulcus or groove. 
it demarcates the position of the interventricular septum inside, which separates the two ventricles. This is the left auricle, and here is the right uh, auricle. These notched parts of the atria resemble a dog's ear, and hence the name auricle. This slight groove between the openings of the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava is the sulcus terminalis. It has an embryological origin. It marks the fusion of the two parts from which the atrium developed. The right border of the heart consists mainly of the right atrium, the inferior border of the right ventricle, the left border as seen from the front is a thin strip of left ventricle. The superior border is formed by the left atrium and the superior vena cava entering the right atrium. The apex of the heart is formed by the left ventricle. The inferior or diaphragmatic surface consists mainly of the left ventricle and partly the right ventricle. The base or the posterior surface consists of the left atrium with the four pulmonary veins entering it. And now the internal features for orientation. Note the superior vena cava, aorta, pulmonary trunk, right ventricle, and right atrium. Most of the wall of the right atrium has been removed. This is part of the auricle, and note how it overlies the commencement of the aorta. Looking in the cavity, I'm now running the pointer on the interatrial septum, which separates the two atria. And this saucer-shaped depression that you see in the septum is the fossa ovalis. This is the remains of the foramen ovale in the fetus. Can you recall its function in the fetal heart? It allowed blood from the inferior vena cava to flow directly into the left atrium. This is the opening of the inferior vena cava. This is the remains of the valve of the inferior vena cava, which guards this opening of the coronary sinus. Maybe as we zoom in and tilt it, you can see that. The coronary sinus admits the tip of the owner's little finger. How many openings can you recall in the right atrium? Well, there is the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, coronary sinus, and then this big opening that leads from the atrium into the ventricle. This is the atrioventricular orifice. I have sectioned this heart to show two more features of the right atrium. This ridge-like structure that you see is the crista terminalis, and it corresponds to the sulcus terminalis. These parallel bundle of muscle fibers, or these ridges, are called musculae pectinate. Looking into the cavity of the right ventricle, note the thickness of the ventricular wall. It is much thicker than that of the atrium. In the ventricle are three kinds of bundles of muscle fibers. You can see one in this specimen. These irregular bundles running along in every which way are called trabeculae carnae. This here, and what I'm touching now, is one of the cusps of the tricuspid valve. There are three cusps. This one 
is the anterior cusp, this is the septal cusp, and down here is the posterior cusp. This smooth area leading to the pulmonary trunk is called the infundibulum. This is one of the semilunar cusps. There are three semilunar cusps which guard the opening of the pulmonary orifice. Looking into this right ventricle, note the finger-like projection, the papillary muscle. These cord-like structures are chordae tendine. They extend from the papillary muscle to the cusps of the tricuspid valve. This bundle of fibers extending from the interventricular septum to the base of the papillary muscle is the septomarginal band. It is also called the moderator band since the right branch of the bundle of his, the part of the conduction system, travels this. The chordae tendine extend from the papillary muscle to the cusps and they go to adjacent cusps so that when the ventricle contracts and they pull the cusps, they bring the borders together. For orientation, note the superior vena cava, aorta, pulmonary trunk, the left atrium, left ventricle, and the right ventricle. Looking down into the pulmonary trunk, note the three semilunar cusps. The pulmonary trunk divides into two pulmonary arteries, and that division takes place in this arch of the aorta. So here is the right pulmonary artery, and this is the left pulmonary artery. Going back to the sectioned heart, note how thick the interventricular septum is. Part of this up here is thinner. Also note this cusp of the mitral valve and the papillary muscle. These are the trabeculae carnae. This is the other cusp of the mitral valve. This smooth area leading to the aortic orifice is the aortic vestibule. It corresponds to the infundibulum of the right ventricle. And now on to the coronary arteries which supply the heart muscle itself. There are two of them. The right coronary artery arises from the aortic sinus just close to this uh, right auricle and lies in this groove, the coronary sulcus. It gives these branches to supply the right ventricle and also sends a branch from here to go and supply the sinoatrial node. As this comes along, it gives a branch that descends along this margin of the heart and that is the marginal branch of the right coronary. The main artery still continues in the groove, and as it comes posteriorly, it gives a branch to lie in the posterior interventricular uh, sulcus or groove, and is the posterior interventricular branch. A little small branch of the right coronary is still left, which continues in this uh, groove or the coronary sulcus. The left coronary artery passes backwards as it arises from the aortic sinus and quickly divides into two branches. One that descends along the anterior interventricular groove and is called the left anterior descending or the anterior interventricular branch of the left coronary. The other branch runs along the atrioventricular groove and is called the circumflex branch. As it comes posteriorly, 
it anastomoses or it ends by anastomosing with the continuation of the right coronary after that had given off the an posterior interventricular branch. You are looking at the cast of the coronary arteries. The right was injected with the yellow dye and the left with the red. The left supplies mainly the left part of the heart, whereas the right supplies the right side and also supplies both the nodes, the SA node and the AV node. The two arteries share the supply of the interatrial septum. In this specimen of the coronary cast, I want you to notice these two bulges, the aortic sinuses from which the coronary arteries originate. Here is the left coronary and this is the right. In front of my fingers is the LAD, the most commonly occluded artery in myocardial infarction. Most cardiac veins accompany the coronary arteries. Accompanying the LAD is the great cardiac vein, the largest one. Accompanying the marginal branch is the small cardiac vein, which drains directly into the right atrium. Accompanying the posterior interventricular artery is the middle cardiac vein. These veins drain into this little sac called the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is located between the left atrium and the left ventricle. You have already seen where it opens into the right atrium. And here you can note that the opening of the coronary sinus is located close to the opening of the inferior vena cava. In addition to these named veins, there are numerous small veins which open into all the four chambers of the heart, and those small veins are called vena cordis minimis. Another thing you may have noted, but I didn't point out, is this structure here. This is the ligamentum arteriosum, the remains of the ductus arteriosus, which connects the pulmonary trunk to the aortic arch. Looking at a large heart, it is because the heart was diseased and perhaps also the person was a little larger than the other ones. What I want you to note is this trough right here. This person had a double coronary bypass. Here is one right here. So this is the segment of the coronary artery that was blocked and needed to be bypassed. So they attached a part over here so blood could flow from that through this and then down like that. The other bypass is in this posterior aspect and if you looked at it closely, you could even see some blue thread which they use to stitch this to the heart. So this is the second bypass. This heart is from someone who had a coronary bypass to replace part of the blocked LAD as well as had an artificial valve to replace the diseased mitral valve. 